Chapter Four of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Wolves of the Desert. Olgerd Vladislav filled his jeweled goblet with crimson wine from a golden jug and thrust the vessel across the ebony table to Conan the Cimmerian. Olgerd's apparel would have satisfied the vanity of any Zaporoskan hetman. His collot was of white silk, with pearls sewn on the bosom. Girdled at the waist with a bakuriat belt, its skirts were drawn back to reveal his wide silken breeches, tucked into short boots of soft green leather, adorned with gold thread. On his head was a green silk turban, wound about a spired helmet, chased with gold. His only weapon was a broad, curved, Turkese knife in an ivory sheath girdled high on his left hip, Kozak fashion. Throwing himself back in his gilded chair with its carven eagles, Olgerd spread his booted legs before him and gulped down the sparkling wine noisily. To his splendor, the huge Cimmerian opposite him offered a strong contrast, with his square-cut black mane, brown-scored countenance, and burning blue eyes. He was clad in black mesh mail, and the only glitter about him was the broad gold buckle of the belt which supported his sword in its worn leather scabbard. They were alone in the silk-walled tent, which was hung with gilt-worked tapestries and littered with rich carpets and velvet cushions, the loot of the caravans. From outside came a low, incessant murmur, the sound that always accompanies a great throng of men, in camp or otherwise. An occasional gust of desert wind rattled the palm leaves. "'Today in the shadow, tomorrow in the sun,' quoth Olgerd, loosening his crimson girdle a trifle and reaching again for the wine-jug. "'That's the way of life. Once I was a hetman on the Zaporoska. Now I'm a desert chief. Seven months ago you were hanging on a cross outside Kauron. Now you're lieutenant to the most powerful raider between Turan and the western meadows. You should be thankful to me. For recognizing my usefulness? Conan laughed and lifted the jug. When you allow the elevation of a man, one can be sure that you'll profit by his advancement. I've earned everything I've won with my blood and sweat. He glanced at the scars on the insides of his palms. There were scars, too, on his body, scars that had not been there seven months ago. You fight like a regiment of devils, conceded Olgerd. But don't get to thinking that you've had anything to do with the recruits who swarmed in to join us. It was our success in raiding, guided by my wit that brought them in. These nomads are always looking for a successful leader to follow, and they have more faith in a foreigner than in one of their own race. There's no limit to what we may accomplish. We have eleven thousand men now. In another year we may have three times that number. We've contented ourselves so far with raids on the Turanian outposts and the city-states to the west. With thirty or forty thousand men, we'll raid no longer. We'll invade and conquer and establish ourselves as rulers. I'll be emperor of all Shem yet, and you'll be my vizier, so long as you carry out my orders unquestioningly. In the meantime, I think we'll ride eastward and storm that Turanian outpost at Vizek, where the caravans pay toll. Conan shook his head. I think not. Olgerd glared, his quick temper irritated. What do you mean, you think not? I do the thinking for this army. There are enough men in this band now for my purpose, answered the Cimmerian. I'm sick of waiting. I have a score to settle. Oh! Olgerd scowled and gulped wine, then grinned. Still thinking of that cross, eh? <laughs> well, I like a good hater, but that can wait. You told me once you'd aid me in taking Koran, said Conan. 
Yes, but that was before I began to see the full possibilities of our power, answered Olgerd. I was only thinking of the loot in the city. I don't want to waste our strength unprofitably. Koran is too strong a nut for us to crack now. Maybe in a year. Within the week, answered Conan, and the Kozak stared at the certainty in his voice. Listen, said Olgerd. Even if I were willing to throw away men on such a hair-brained attempt, what could you expect? Do you think these wolves would besiege and take a city like Kauron? There'll be no siege, answered the Cimmerian. I know how to draw Constantius out into the plain. And what then? asked Olgerd with an oath. In the arrow play, our horsemen would have the worst of it for the armor of the Ashuri is the better, and when it came to sword-strokes their close-marshaled ranks of trained swordsmen would cleave through our loose lines and scatter our men like chaff before the wind. Not if there were three thousand desperate Hyborian horsemen fighting in a solid wedge, such as I could teach them, answered Conan. <laughs> and where would you secure three thousand Hyborians? asked Olgerd with vast sarcasm. Will you conjure them out of the air? I have them, answered the Cimmerian imperturbably. Three thousand men of Kauron camp at the oasis of Akrel awaiting my orders. What? Olgerd glared like a startled wolf. Ay, men who had fled from the tyranny of Constantius. Most of them have been living the lives of outlaws in the deserts east of Kauron, and are gaunt and hard and desperate as man-eating tigers. One of them will be a match for any three squat mercenaries. It takes oppression and hardship to stiffen men's guts and put the fire of hell into their thews. They were broken up into small bands. All they needed was a leader. They believed the word I sent them by my riders, and assembled at the oasis and put themselves at my disposal. All this without my knowledge? A feral light began to gleam in Olgerd's eye. He hitched at his weapon girdle. It was I they wished to follow, not you. And what did you tell these outcasts to gain their allegiance? There was a dangerous ring in Olgerd's voice. I told them that I'd use this horde of desert wolves to help them destroy Constantius and give Kauron back into the hands of its citizens. You fool! whispered Olgerd. Do you deem yourself chief already? The men were on their feet, facing each other across the ebony board, devil lights dancing in Olgerd's cold gray eyes, a grim smile on the Cimmerian's hard lips. I'll have you torn between four palm trees, said the Kozak calmly. Call the men and bid them do it, challenged Conan. See if they obey you. Baring his teeth in a snarl, Olgerd lifted his hand, then paused. There was something about the confidence in the Cimmerian's dark face that shook him. His eyes began to burn like those of a wolf. You scared! Gum of the western hills, he muttered. Have you dared seek to undermine my power? I didn't have to, answered Conan. You lied when you said that I had nothing to do with bringing in the new recruits. I had everything to do with it. They took your orders, but they fought for me. There is not room for two chiefs of the Zuagirs. They know I am the stronger man. I understand them better than you, and they me, because I am a barbarian, too. And what will they say when you ask them to fight for Koran? asked Olgerg sardonically. They'll follow me. I promised them a camel train of gold from the palace. Koran will be willing to pay that as a guerdon for getting rid of Constantius. After that... I'll lead them against the Turanians, as you have planned. They want loot, and they'd as soon fight Constantius for it as anybody. 
In Olgerd's eyes grew a recognition of defeat. In his red dreams of empire he had missed what was going on about him. Happenings and events that had seemed meaningless before now flashed into his mind with their true significance, bringing a realization that Conan spoke no idle boast. The giant black mailed figure before him was the real chief of the Zuagirs. "'Not if you die!' murmured Olgerd, and his hand flickered toward his hilt. But quick as the stroke of a great cat, Conan's arm shot across the table and his fingers locked on Olgerd's forearm. There was a snap of breaking bones, and for a tense instant the scene held, the men facing each other as motionless as images, perspiration starting out on Olgerd's forehead. Conan laughed, never easing his grip on the broken arm. "'Are you fit to live, Olgerd?' His smile did not alter as the corded muscles rippled in knotting ridges along his forearm and his fingers ground into the Kozak's quivering flesh. There was the sound of broken bones grating together, and Olgerd's face turned the color of ashes. Blood oozed from his lip where his teeth sank but he uttered no sound. With a laugh Conan released him and drew back, and the Kozak swayed, caught the table edge with his good hand to steady himself. "'I give you life, Olgerd, as you gave it to me,' said Conan tranquilly, "'though it was for your own ends that you took me down from the cross. It was a bitter test you gave me then. You couldn't have endured it.' Neither could any one but a western barbarian. Take your horse and go. It's tied behind the tent, and food and water are in the saddlebags. None will see you going, but go quickly. There's no room for a fallen chief on the desert. If the warriors see you, maimed and deposed, they'll never let you leave the camp alive. Olgerd did not reply. Slowly, without a word, he turned and stalked across the tent through the flapped opening. Unspeaking, he climbed into the saddle of the great white stallion that stood tethered there in the shade of a spreading palm tree, and, unspeaking, with his broken arm thrust in the bosom of his kalat, he reined the steed about and rode eastward into the open desert, out of the life of the people of the Zuagir. Inside the tent Conan emptied the wine-jug and smacked his lips with relish. Tossing the empty vessel into a corner, he braced his belt and strode out through the front opening, halting for a moment to let his gaze sweep over the lines of camel-hair tents that stretched before him, and the white-robed figures that moved among them, arguing, singing, mending bridles, or wetting tulwars. He lifted his voice in a thunder that carried to the farthest confines of the encampment. Ay, you dogs! Sharpen your ears and listen. Gather around here. I have a tale to tell you. End of chapter 4